Thank you kindly for being here, for making it in the middle of the semester. It's really a pleasure. Uh, I hope we have even more conversations across the Bay. We are indeed very close and we have to make this possible despite the traffic. I'm going to speak for roughly 35, um, hopefully not 40 minutes. And I'll try to uh, pause and explain for those of you for whom this might be um, very disciplinary, very specific. So I'll try to stop and broaden. And I certainly do have some good pictures to show later on. <laughs> Latin American hyperfetishism and the materialist turn. Philosophers and political theorists often confine literature and cultural production more broadly to serve as illustration to their ideas. That literature, qua literature, or photography as art form could think through specific issues seems counterintuitive because interpretation is indispensable for such thinking to emerge. At the same time, the post-anthropocentric turn, varied research agendas that cluster around Latour, Bennett, and others, has no qualm with appreciating the agentic properties of, say, a hammer. And yet the object has to be banged with to do something. Mutaris Mutandis books, by way of their sheer semantic density, and by nudging readers in various ways, I would claim, do. How is the question of the hour. It seems to me that the locus of agency is distributed among textual formations and reader communities in ways that reception theory, genetic criticism, and data mining, to name some of the recent trends, are ill-equipped to address, at least by themselves. So is a hermeneutics of suspicion, according to Rita Felsky in The Limits of Critique, where she also writes in the wake of the post-anthropocentric turn. If Felsky were right, there would be no need to read much into the prevailing U.S. Eurocentrism of the new paradigm, the tokenistic inclusion of the Brazilian Ribeiros de Castro or the Mexican De Racine, Manuel de Landa notwithstanding. However, curtailing critique seems disingenuous or naive when confronted with the realities of Latin American cultural production shaped to this day by extractivism, much as the region itself. And here uh, I pause for a moment to remind you that Rita Felsky, who is um, a, a very influential professor of English literature, uh, would claim, based on similar post-anthropocentric sources, that it's time to stop doing critique, uh, to stop doing suspicion, and to have a, a social awareness of literature, because instead, uh, describing positively by way of actor network theory will carry out whatever potential is in literature. In other words, for uh, Felsky uh, to think with the agency of objects and to decenter the human means to stop doing suspicion and social critique, I happen to go in a different direction. I actually think this is all the better for uh, social critique. Um, and then in terms of extractivism and the region, um, some of you may know a great book by Erica Beckman that studies, um, it's called Capital Fictions, it studies novels in the 19th and 20th century in Latin America that all happen to revolve around a commodity. 100 Years of Solitude by Garcia Marquez, On the Banana, um, La Voragine by Jose Eustacio Rivera, On Robber, and so on and so forth. Right? So extractivism in Latin America is something not easily parsed out from the art of novel writing itself, right? In what follows then, I will chart something of a middle path. I find that appreciating certain works of literary and visual art qua works of art affects conceptual apparatuses beyond providing case studies. I am not speaking of their occasional bouts of essayism. Rather, I am reminded of how, as Foucault reports in Les Mots et les Choses, Reading Borges, quote, shattered the familiar landscapes of his thought, unquote. In this talk, I expose the conceptual purchase of works of art in an unfamiliar terrain, affecting our basic rapport to objects. I understand this domain as was as always already mediated by the social, but not reducible to it. You may recognize already the Scylla and Charybdis that flank my navigation as historical and new materialism. The former in the Marxist tradition seeks to denounce the social relations that magically endowed things such as luxury items or privately owned land hide from view. The latter in the more recent Latourian tradition suspends social systemic analysis 
or carries it out only in piecemeal fashion and focuses on the agency of things while eclipsing the question of social relations, particularly of labor. One seeks to debunk an order of things by demonstrating its arbitrariness. The other assumes it as its starting point and intervenes within it through thought-provoking elucidations of the techno-social. Fels keep its one against the other. Uh, I do not so much reconcile them as offer a third position. And in honor of Fernando Ortiz, the Cuban anthropologist and social um, studies um, genius, really, in, in various domains, not unproblematically, I call uh, this mode of thinking transcultural materialism. I take it that transcultural materialism articulates through the powers of art, social critique, and descriptive analysis. The term itself has more of a deictic value than an abstract function. It signals an expansive praxis, not a distilled theory. Still, for a working definition, consider this praxis as the non-instrumental use of stories and literary language, among other artistic devices in the Shlovsky sense of the term, that upsets the nature-culture divide, affect our rapport to things, and reassess our place in human, non-human history. That's a, an awkward slash one sometimes needs, human slash non-human history. I'm bringing those two together, and I think that Ortiz does. Um, we can talk some more about that, of course, in Q&A. Ortiz, uh, famously treats tobacco and sugar as imminent ecological agents, but also as transcendent economical agents. For Ortiz, sugar and tobacco are both crop and commodity. This assimilates Marx's suspicion while showcasing Latourian neo-positivism avant la lettre. Moreover, it shows how these poles can coincide counterpunctually. As I demonstrate in my current manuscript, Things with a History, Ortiz is but one figure in a parallel Latin American tradition that responds to many of the pressing issues of today's criticism. Others include, in one epoch, José Eustacio Rivera and Euclides da Cunha, in another, Ariel Magnus, Alejandro Sambra, Gabriela Cabezón Cámara, and Antonio José Ponte. As the odd, uncharitable Germanist colleague every now and then remarks, the region has not produced a robust corpus of original philosophers. When it does continue to produce, it's a rich corpus of literary authors, so-called creative writers, um, whose work is a veritable intellectual trove. World literature only credits Borges with this achievement, but I will show how there's a transcultural materialist constellation of figures that um, invite us to think in a renewedly uh, monist fashion. My focus today is on an instance of transcultural materialism, materialism which I call Hyperfetishism. This is a practice. It consists on the exacerbation of commodity fetishism to disrupt unreflective ways of relating to things without reducing them, and this is of course important, to abstractions. Where cultural critics traditionally unmasks, hyperfetishists play along so thoroughly with this masquerade that the artifice is revealed and transformed by way of excess. Three parts follow. First, I further define the concept of uh, hyperfetishism by opposition to Marx's commodity fetishism. Then for the bulk of my presentation, I offer, in more of a workshop style, a close reading of works that successfully carry out that operation. In the final section of my talk, I will draw some general conclusions. This gives you the, the overview. Very well. So let's see if uh, we can go from critique to exacerbation. Um, you might recognize here uh, the famous uh, chapter starting uh, Das Kapital, Marx and Engels' work, that defines commodity fetishism and that more importantly situates the general theory of value. And this is a very reason for commodity fetishism to exist, uh, explaining the general theory of value. This is going to lead to how Marx understands that notion. And so we read that the mutual relations of the producers within which the social character of their labor affirms itself take the form of a social relation between the products. So instead of 
looking or even thinking that there are factories um, around the world, really, not just in China, that are necessary to create something like a Samsung G8 or an iPhone or any other gadget. We only look at that gadget as if that was the whole story and cannot appreciate the social relations. We have this fetishism of the commodity. We can only look at the thing and forget that it is made of social relations, which is the reason why Marx will talk about uh, religion here in a very interesting turn, which I highlighted in, in red, but of course you're free to read the whole passage. Uh, his one analogy is the misenveloped religions regions of the religious world. And this is the same thinker that will talk of um, religion, Christianism in particular, as the opium of the masses. So the task at hand is to dispel such mythology, to break free of the religion that makes you think that, say, and I'll come back to this example later on, there's something about a ferragamo shoe, you know, beyond the social relations that lead to this fetish of the Ferragamo show, right? That, that's where Marx is. Marx says, debunk and bring down this false religion, this, these idols that are commodities. Um, and the language that he uses is consistent with this um, idea. Um, we will read things like um, the specific social character of each producer's labor does not show itself except in the act of exchange. Right? What matters, because again, he's trying to ground the general theory of value, is exchange value. It becomes more and more about exchange value than about use value. Right? And in fact, um, exchange value can eclipse use value. Right? Um, sometimes commodities don't even have to be useful to be coveted. Uh, so much so are we under the spell of this religion. We fail to see in these articles the material receptacles of homogeneous human labor because for Marx, um, an hour wage by a uh, mason or by a shoemaker or by a pianist should be worth the same as an hour's wage by anyone else, right? Uh, homogeneous human labor. And so it's really um, a shame for Marx that we don't appreciate how these things are receptacles, you see, for our men. The, the, the measure of, of the general theory of value, which is the hour of work per person working it. Okay? Um, and uh, he, however, has to find a counterexample in literature, um, in Robinson Crusoe. Um, I'll read and then comment. When I state that coats or boots stand in a relation to linen, because it is the universal incarnation of actual human labor, the absurdity of the statement is self-evident. Why would Robinson Crusoe make this so absurd? Because in the island, where there's no one to trade with, apparently not with Friday, right? Um, then there is only use value. And so in this island, you realize that, um, I'll use some, uh, I'll, I'll stick to the shoe, the Ferragamo shoe has only its use value. So if the Ferragamo shoe will withstand the elements, if you can walk in it right, for long periods of time and, and that will protect your shoe, then it's worth something. right? Because there's no one to buy or to exchange everything other about a Ferragamo shoe than just protecting your foot. right? Uh, I think it's very interesting that Robinson Crusoe would be the, the place where Marx finds his um, exception. Um, Okay, just let me just um, give you a couple more brush strokes about the marks and then show you where I'm trying to take it. So, um, let's just read this part here. What, however, does belong to us as objects is our value. Our natural intercourse as commodities proves it. In the eyes of each other, we are nothing but exchange values. This is the commodity speaking, you see? Um, Marx tries to explain this by doing, again, something very literary, not just invoke Robinson Crusoe, but write as if he were a commodity that explains to us um, the values that we are uh, instilling upon it. Right? It is no part of us as object. Our use value may be a thing that interests men. Right? So it seems that Things have no agency for Marx. There's nothing in the thing that has agency. 
it's either use value, because that's in, in what you physically do with it, right? Or there's exchange value, how you barter it. But things have no value. And he will go as far as to say the following. A pearl or a diamond is valuable as a pearl or a diamond. So far, no chemist has ever discovered exchange value either in a pearl or a diamond, right? So Marx would say there's nothing valuable about diamond. You could go back and say, yes, but you can cut through glass. It's the hardest substance. It will survive the centuries. Well, sure, that's your use value, that's your exchange value. But there's nothing inherently valuable in the diamond, right? Now. Um, if you're familiar with the rudiments of post-anthropocentrism and this um, reappraisal of the inherent value of things indeed, then there's something quite problematic here, right? And it would seem that these perspectives are incompatible. When Marx says something like, uh, commodity fetishism is the process, I'm not citing that here, uh, whereby the life of the thing is over, and the life of the commodity has began, right? We would see a start separation in what uh, more recent materialisms don't see as a start separation. So, someone like Felsky, and I'm you know going back to her just because it's an interesting uh, interlocutor, um, would say, okay, this is the reason why we have to abandon Marx, right? Because Marx only thinks about commodities and not about things. Um, what I think is that we should maybe redefine the role of critique from, yes, suspicion and bringing us back to uh, use value and dispelling commodity fetishism and exchange value to uh, more of a supplementary relationship where we do both things. We take into consideration the agency of the thing, right? Um, and we also do uh, social critique. I don't think that these things are at odds in any way, and I think I can illustrate that with some um, examples. So, on to part two. And are there any questions? I think it's okay maybe to take some. That's some pretty abstract uh, stuff that we're dealing with right there. But maybe this will also elucidate. So, these are some Latin American transcultural materialist interventions. Um, and they are sources that exacerbate, rather than critique, commodity uh, The Colombian Jose Asuncion Silva's 1908 posthumous poem, La Voz de las Cosas. His 1925 uh, decadentist novel, De Sobremesa, After Dinner Conversation. Silva's countryman, Fernando Vallejo's work, which builds a natural bridge between the 19th century and the present. Vallejo writes about Silva. Notably, his 1995 biography of the author, Almas en Pena, Chapulas Negras. And Vallejo's more recent, Casablanca la Bella, from 2014. Also, Vallejo's countrywoman on the Mexican side, Margot Glantz who writes in 2005, Historia de una mujer que caminó por la vida con zapatos de diseñador, the history or story of a woman who walked through life with designer shoes. And finally, her countrywoman, Daniela Rosell's photographic essay, Ricas y Famosas, from 2002, which I'll, I'll circulate, try not to get too distracted because these images are... <laughs> um, and I also marked uh, a particular picture that I might try to, to come back um, to. Okay, um, so let me just walk you through these texts, and I have to be succinct, but um, let's see if we can find a way of exacerbating commodity fetishism, of going beyond rather than seek to debunk, de debunk it, and see if there's any lesson for us in terms of how we relate to, to non-humans. La voz de las cosas. Si os encerrara yo en mis estrofas, frágiles cosas que sonreís, Pálido lirio que te deshojas, rayo de luna sobre el tapiz, de húmedas flores y verdes hojas, que al tibio soplo de mayo abrís, si os encerrara yo en mis estrofas, pálidas cosas que sonreís. Si aprisionaros pudiera el verso, fantasmas grises, cuando pasáis, móviles formas del universo, sueños confusos, seres que os vais. Ósculo triste, suave y perverso, que entre las sombras al alma dais, si aprisionaros pudiera el verso, fantasmas grises, cuando pasáis. Um, I find it a stunning poem. <laughs> and it's a 
has many merits, and Silva is known for his rhythm, for his rhymes, for his musicality. He's bringing in uh, the patterns of Italian verse into, into Spanish, into the Spanish language. Um, but this is also very narrative. There's a narrative quality to it, and what it narrates is the impossibility of things to have a voice, right? And so this is the, the poetic voice, not so much ventriloquizing things, but expressing the impossibility of ventriloquizing things, right? While at the same time, I, I would claim it uh, recognizes some agency to objects. Uh, this is not just in the poem, but when you think of Silva's work at large. Um, and I'll show the novel in a moment, but Silva, as it happens, was the son of uh, a patrician uh, Bogotano man, Ricardo Silva, uh, also a writer, who owned a shop. And very much the same thing happened with Kafka. You know, there's a Hermann Kafka und Sohn store um, in Prague, and there was a Ricardo Silva e Hijo store in Bogota, lo and behold. And they were both in the business of uh, importing uh, luxury goods, except the pianos that would be produced in uh, Bohemia and other crystals and so on were a little farther removed here in Bogota. And so one could say, and indeed uh, Vallejo helps us to see that biographically um, Silva was immersed in commodity fetishism. He, he was just surrounded by it. Uh, he sings to it. He sings the praises of commodity fetishism. And so you can be um, a certain kind of Marxist and say, you see, this is the ideology of the upper classes. Um, this is part of you know, uh, extractivism because this is a country, Colombia, that was exporting bananas and rubber and was buying you know, uh, the, the flugel pianos and, and so on. And, and this is a staple of underdevelopment. I mean, you can really go far along these lines. And all of these things, I think, are right. At the same time, though, what do you do with the sheer beauty of, of these uh, things? Uh, just to go to, into some detail on, on how he writes, um, note the kind of things that we're talking about. So there's a lily, there's a moon ray, there's flowers, right? Um, so these are literary objects, but they're also things that could be uh, surrounding the author at the site of, of writing. Um, the first ones have uh, you know bright white colors, but then there's a phantasmatic gray quality to things. So you see there this, this contrast, this frustration of the ungraspable thingness of, of things. Uh, gray goes that pass, moving things of the universe. So even the thing is not enough, right? He wants to get at the thingness of the thing, but that is the, the ghost that is, that is not there. What's also fascinating about this poem is that it's not animistic, like Walt Disney's movie Fantasia, where you know the cop talks and dances. And that's easy, I would say, right? And that's, that's really not getting at the agency of things because the agency of things happens in, um, in the context of a distributed agency, right? Um, bear with me with this example. When the National Rifle Association says it's not um, guns that kill people, it's people who kill people with guns, I would claim with no materialism, no, it's people with guns who kill people. One sentence people with guns, because the locus of agency is distributed among humans and non-humans according to new materialism, which is the kind of insight that Marx didn't have. He couldn't have had it. Um, and then finally here, uh, note the cadence at the, at, the, at the fracture here in the envoi. The osculo triste, suave y perverso, suave y perverso, right? Que entre las sombras al alma lies. Um, this, you know, breaks the cadence and it's time to to leave the poem, as it were, and, and move on. We can talk some more about this in more detail if you'd like. Okay, I won't read through the whole thing, but this is the opening of Silva's novel. Famous, famous passage uh, where you have what has been interpreted, and this I find bewildering the more I think about it, as a proto-cinematic scene, as if there's a camera doing this, uh, you know, long shot of uh, the interior. I really don't think that's that's where Silva was, you know, that's, I don't think that's, that's what, I, I find that to be the best reading, but um, what he'll do is constellate things like China and crystals and all of the luxury things that might come from a place, place like Bohemia, again with light, 
um, textures, right? There's an investment in situating us haptically, right? But also in, you know, expressing sheer love for objects. This is uh, Kelly Washburn's translation. I'll, I'll read uh, a few lines. Secluded by the shade of gauze and lace, the warm light of the lamp fell in a circle over the crimson velvet of the tablecloth. And as it lit up the three china cups, which were golden at the bottom from the traces of thick coffee, and a cut crystal bottle full of transparent liqueur, shining with gold particles, it left the rest of the large and silent chamber awash in a gloomy purple semi-darkness. The effect of the cast of the carpet, the tapestries, and the wall hangings. Um, this is clearly not about efficiency. Uh, this could be described as, and they were chatting after dinner. And actually, the title of the novel already says, says as much, the sobremesa, after dinner conversation, okay? This is idle language in terms of use value. Cups contain a liquid. In terms of exchange value, yes, there's some boasting about these expensive things, but at a certain point, it's already too much, right? I think we're getting at a, at a third uh, degree of engagement with materiality, which is what I'm calling hyperfetishism or exacerbation of the commodity fetish, right? And there's something there that alters the way of thinking of things, okay? This is, again, my claim about how there's an agent agentiality also of the very text, okay? If you go with the text, if you follow its, its inner movement, um, it will perhaps make you aware differently about your surroundings. This is a common experience reading reading the Sobre Mesa. Okay, you, you close the book and you look around and it's like, wow, where am I? Uh, could we not claim that this is an effect of the text? Okay. Um, now, there are some complexities here worth considering through Fernando Vallejo, who is a contemporary author. He's alive, he's been in Berkeley a number of times, um, and he um, writes the biography of Silva. In the biography, he will tell us how for Silva things could be uh, both economical and imminent at the same time. So they could be about exchange value as they could be about use value. They could be about the thingness, but also about the embeddedness within an economy that Silva was not um, beside or this, this kind of, uh, of problem. So he'll say things like, para Silva no existía Dios, existía el crédito, right? Dios es el crédito. Because he knows that Silva was in debt because he owned too many things in the store and this was the real drama of his life, right? That he was broke, that he brought his father's store to bankruptcy because uh, he was just uh, hoarding all of these things that he imported. And Vallejo will give us beautiful things in that biography, like the image of someone walking through the muddy streets of the high up on the Andes city of Bogota, in the, in the neighborhood of La Candelaria downtown, right? And then, like, wipe the shoes to walk into the grand store of Ricardo Silva Eijo. And so, um, I think we could also go back here and think in terms of debt and we would still be reading the same passage. How much, how much did that cost? How much is that perhaps uh, something that is owed by uh, Jose Fernandez, a fantastically rich um, character who expresses many of the frustrations of Silva, Silva the man. So I'm doing something similar to what actor network theory folks are doing, which is going into the text and describe the actual positivist uh, events of literature while also preserving the kind of suspicion that I think Marx would um, invite us to have. Um, Nada tenía Silva salvo sus manos rotas por las que se le iban lujos cuanto le entraba en préstamos. What Silva did have is his pen and that perhaps just added idleness and debt to his, to his life. He was, uh, he was not a, you know, this, this is not someone who lived off his, his royalty checks. Uh, many of his works never saw the light while he was alive. Um, now, Fernando Vallejo uh, 
inherits some of this hyperfetishism in a beautiful novel called Casablanca la Bella that is very boring if you have no fetish. If you do have a fetish with things, it can be very fun to read because it's all about putting this house together and buying stuff for the house. It's a novel of stuff. Um, and uh, here he's going to opine at length on which sanitaries are the best and he'll say that it's water saving. Uh, but this is after he has convinced himself that that is indeed the way to go because he wants to find the sanitaries of his youth because he's a very conservative writer and a conservative figure and so he wants to find big massive ceramic sanitaries and finally he's persuaded that um, he should be saving some water and this is very um, inane unless you see this as a continuation of the kind of uh, hyper fetish that Silva, the, the, the figure behind Vallejo, was, was getting at. Um, we also see here, if you'll recall, in Walter Benjamin, the idea that the new has the shape of the old, and he's thinking of how light bulbs resemble candles. There's a Fernando Vallejo looking at um, hotel uh, cards, right? And missing keys, because they don't have the shape of the old. And then going on to say, but sanitaries are still thrones. They still have the shape of, of the throne. Okay, now Margot Glantz, this is my third, I, I guess, not just case study, but um, agent of hyperfetishism, uh, will give us the story of the woman who walked through life in designer shoes and the audience's reactions to this are varied. Um, there is the idea that she is uh, the same kind of argument that could have been waged against Silva, speaking for an elite, that she's an elitist, or maybe she's mocking us and she cannot be serious, uh, but she'll say things like um, there is a cultural history to shoes, um, she will put the locus of agency starting the book in the shoe, a medida que pasa el tiempo el zapato olvida su procedencia y su epistemología, as time goes by, the shoe forgets his uh, origins and etymology, as if shoes could remember or forget. Um, she will speak at length about her favorite designer, Salvatore Ferragamo, who may come to us mere mortals as a very expensive uh, luxury brand, but for Margot's character, uh, it's in fact an artisan and an artist of very fine sensibility and she actually aspires to write a novel as if she were Ferragamo designing crafting a shoe okay um, one could perhaps should also think of this in terms of uh, Freudian fetishism which is not the same as what I'm describing here but I think um, it has to do with um, uh, value as well and so, interestingly, this uh, alter ego of Nora Garcia, who is the protagonist of the story of the woman who wants to walk through life with designer shoes, um, actually doesn't want the most expensive shoes, but shoes that are expensive but that she can afford, and finds that there is dignity in wearing those shoes, and finally sits down to write a book when she's wearing designer shoes, right? Um, there are many topics here, um, later on in the novel, if you can call it that, because there are various short stories connected very thinly, um, the protagonist, Nora Garcia, will find a lump in her breasts and will have a cancer scare, that's kind of like the closing arc of something that starts with a designer shoe. There's reflections about how high heel shoes um, uh, perk her body up and uh, and make her courageous and bold um, and you can imagine how Margot can get also uh, critique from different kinds of feminism because she does have a, a certain style of saying things like um, one is never fully dressed until you have your shoes on right and and so she's playing the grand dame here at the same time that the character will say things like it's not the most expensive shoes it's expensive shoes that I can buy right 
Um, she will also walk around London, that's one of the motifs in the book, and say that she realizes she's from the third world, which is all the more reason why she has to try harder at wearing uh, the right kinds of shoes. Okay? So, is it a critique of commodity fetishism? We have to, you know, wear sandals and forget about fancy shoes because that's the right thing to do? Not really. It isn't that. It's a different mode. It's a different way of intervening in the human, non-human path. And I also wouldn't read it, but we can certainly discuss this as um, self-commodification, as, um, you know, reducing one's foot to be an object alongside with the shoe that sheathes it. She will also say, though, that the, shoe, the foot is the original shoe because the foot is leather and it's meant to, uh, you know, uh, help you walk. So she doesn't see the difference between the, the, the natural shoe, right, and the shoe. Again, natural history and history are, are intertwined in interesting ways. Okay. So I get to my uh, pièce de résistance, which is uh, Daniela Rossell, who is a fascinating photographer. This is from 2002. The series actually starts in the mid-90s. Uh, Ruben Gallo has written very insightfully about Daniela Rossell, uh, Natalia Brizuela as well in catalogs. Um, and um, let me just walk you through some of the images and we can perhaps think what we see because she presented them to the world with very little explanation, very little in the way of captions and you might remember that also Benjamin thought that it was unethical to circulate pictures without captions. He was also thinking in Hitler and whatnot but let me just show you a few without captions. You can't really tell, but uh, the woman is crying in this picture. There's, a, there's a, a very bright teardrop falling on her cheek. Um, yes, that is Pancho Villa. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, of course, that is Zapata, sorry, I got mixed up here. And that is uh, a maid who's uh, perhaps cleaning in the background, right? Uh, note this detail here. Bota. So imagine you're walking into a gallery space and all you see is the, these pictures. And actually when she first exhibited them, it was in small format. These days you can go to, you know, the KV or, or really prominent galleries in Berlin and find them in beautiful digital prints in very special collections. They're very uh, valuable uh, works of art. Okay, so I think we've seen enough. Let me go back and, and walk through some of them and tell you what, how, how these work. So if you're thinking in terms of commodity fetishism and you're looking at these with a uh, Marxist lens, then uh, these women are just ridiculously rich and there's something um, obnoxious about this whole um, display of wealth. I won't say that's not true. <laughs> there is indeed conspicuous consumption at work here, but this doesn't tell the whole picture. And the reaction that many critics gave, notably Juan Bijoro, I would say even borders on the racist because they would say things like, um, this is bad taste at, at its worst. And my sense is, who am I to judge what is bad taste? Right? It doesn't help, of course, that it was known that uh, these women are the wives and daughters of prominent Partido Revolucionario Institucional uh, figures. And so very quickly they became these magnets of, of political hatred. But one thing that I think should be said is that this is not high art or high taste. This might in fact be uh, a nouveau riche uh, sense of what is what you should do with your money in terms of decoration and so if you have if you haven't enjoyed you know privilege and minimalism since a young age then maybe this is what you will do when you have the money and there is nothing inherently wrong with that okay 
Um, anyways, and, 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 and here I'm actually taking issue with Ruben Gallo, you know, Ruben Gallo actually wishes for these pictures to have captions and he, he, he says that he hopes the book would have sections because it's not clear which of the pre members is associated to the to the picture and, and, and which of the pan members is associated to, to the picture. Um, and he notes that the discussion, the whole scandal in the 90s, early 2000s in Mexico did not include the photographic merit, but he also doesn't go into great m detail about what the merit is. What is the merit? Look at the composition here. The figure tends to be off the center of uh, the frame. Uh, the figure tends to be looking at the camera and establishing an interesting conversation with our expectations as, as viewers. Um, Daniela Rosell is working in actual homes, actual sites, but also choosing very savvily what goes into this goddess of the sea or this recreation of Angle, right? The boudoir scene uh, depicted in Orientalist photography. And you could say that these um, young women are having fun and playing with their yes, obscene riches. They can indeed be doing all of that at the same time. Um, here, you'll see that she is like a Mary Magdalene, sitting alone at the Last Supper. And that's a really keen twist on iconography, right? Brought about, I would claim, by hyperfetishism, right? A hyperfetishization of the female body, but not just, of course, right? In a context, um, it has been noted that these pictures are the reverse of poverty in Mexico. 1994, you will remember the Chiapas uprising and the reasons for that, and and this was happening in, you know, the mansions of Mexico City, Guadalajara, and Monterrey, uh, where and New York, where these pictures were taken, right? And so the flip side, right? What's outside of the frame is is poverty. Uh, but this is not just social critique, right? Look at how the red in her dress matches the background and matches the painting, okay? There is there's some indulgence also uh, on Daniela Rossell's part. Um, this one really is a, a classic, and how am I doing time-wise, by the way? If You're someone, fine. I'm fine, okay. Uh, look, look at um, this fantastic picture. Here, there's the image of the candidate, uh, her father, um, I forget the name, we could look it up if you'd like. And uh, she is throwing the ashes, maybe on the carpet. Um, this is an image of power, and it's also mocking the model. That's also something that has been observed, who may not know what all the reference are, because Daniela Rossell is putting, her, putting those in, her, in place for her. At the same time, what do we know? Is she the model playing along, criticizing her own family history of professional politicians who speak in the name of the revolution and yet, you know, live this life. Um, another figure of the sea, a pink sea at that, with an a, 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 a extremely heterogeneous Inuit uh, baby, right, not baby, but a doll. Uh, uh, it's an image we haven't seen before. Right? It, it produces, this exacerbation of the commodity produces a different kind of imagery. It's not just gaudy. I think that's what Rouen gets, gets wrong. Um, now this one, uh, that is Paulina Diaz Ordaz, who is the granddaughter of Diaz Ordaz, who was the pre-president that suppressed the student uprising in Tlatelolco, responsible for, uh, you know, the death of, of hundreds of, of students. And so Paulina Diaz Ordaz went on record saying that this was an unflattering picture, that she never agreed to do this, and there was this, this fed the scandal. But um, she's also wearing a t-shirt that says, peep show, one dollar. Um, we're looking at this maybe from the perspective of another lion, another animal. Is that, I mean, that's a really odd angle. It's a very peculiar composition. You have no uh, 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 depth, um, and so you're, you're meant to be looking as, as if hidden in between the furniture, right? Um, 
the punctum here, it's really hard to find because this is so rich, right? It's Rococo all over again. But Daniela Rossell's intervention is in um, the, the statue of, of the, the black kid, right? Um, which is, you know, poking fun at the kind of life of privilege that these characters live. Now, this image, which is the cover of the book and it's very famous, um, is also a peculiar composition because it's seen from above as if you are God or an angel passing judgment on the rich, maybe um, uh, blonde dyed uh, uh, princess and her nanny who is looking at a different points entirely and you can see the white in her eyes and when you see this in a large good quality reproduction is very prominent and it give her, gives her the allure of um, like a, a, a demon in a B movie, right? Her eyes are almost white and, and she had Daniela Rosel to choose this angle among the other possible angles. Um, so, you know, this is clearly uh, critical of the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, but it will reveal any truth about our relationship to objects, about our own objectification, if you go along with the fetish, not if you, you know, uh, have qualms with it. I think you, you really have to go along with the fetish. I turn now to my, my conclusions. Historicizing our changing rapport to objects is more pressing now than ever. In recent years, there has been a seismic transformation in our relationship to things. Prior roughly to 1989, there was no consolidated world wide web or widespread mobile phones, let alone smartphones. No buzz about an internet of things or 3D printing. A much smaller trade in digital age commodities like lithium from Bolivia for batteries a more modest market for global luxury brands like Ferragamo, fewer poor people around the world getting their nourishment from industrial food supply chain, chains, excuse me, fewer better off, food conscious enclaves abandoning them here and there, a larger Amazonian rainforest, and smaller amounts of waste everywhere, among many other possible examples. The cumulative effect of these gradual transformations, which have picked up speed lately, suggests that we currently undergo a shift in a long time prevailing material paradigm. If one can imagine a long standing unwritten pact between humans and non humans, as of late we would be in the process of rewriting it. Take the awe and shock implicit in things are not made to last anymore and multiply it in many directions, some technological and others less so, manufactured or not organic or inorganic, and you may appreciate the conjuncture that literature and art more broadly currently faces. This is not just horror vacui in the uh, photographic or iconographic sense of the word, that there's empty space in the image. This is also uh, a fear of dispossession. Okay? This is like uh, hoarding, again, this compulsive acquisition. As we have seen, narrative and photography have the power to counter fetishize commodities by way of exacerbation and to interrupt our unreflective ways of thinking of things. In the abandonments to the pleasures of literature, there is the potential to repair the suture that Cartesianism has made in Western rationality. We know that we are objects ourselves. We, too, are matter. But the division between res cogitans and res extensa, our thinking selves and our materiality, is so entrenched that it is very difficult for us not to think in those terms. It's easier to fantasize in a literary register that tobacco and sugar are sentient beings that conditions our ways of living, or that the sanitary is the household king, the Ferragamo shoe, the ultimate Madeline, and so on. Metaphor, metonymy, allegory, and literary figures in general supplement what deduction and inference have difficulty grappling with. Under the spell of narrative, we may reassess our social and historical conjuncture rethink our place within the material world entirely. In the mutual enrichment of critique and new materialism, <coughs> contemporary Latin American culture has much to offer. Tellingly, at roughly the same time that Latour was publishing his study around the preface that we have never been modern, Argentine anthropologist Garcia Canclini was publishing his around the premise that Latin Americans deploy strategies to enter and leave modernity. Both are post-1989 reactions, shake-offs of Cold War schemata. For the French thinker, 
Dismantling modernity was an arduous task, for the Argentine less so. Indeed, Latin America's experience with many of the techno-social underpinnings of that thing we call modernity offer a unique vantage point. The region has never taken it for granted or laid claim to its we, how could it? Interestingly, there was a fork in the road. Garcia Canclini developed, developed hybridity in a cultural sense, while Latour did so in a natural, cultural one. We are now at a time when critical agendas may once again overlap. Latin American contemporaneity produces what I have characterized as a recombined transcultural materialism, a form of storytelling that elucidates critical concepts, particularly the continuity of nature and culture across human and non-human history. It is not subservient to any theory, metropolitan or otherwise, but a self-sustaining speculative exercise. One may cite new materialist thinking a la Latour or Bennett to footnote it and not the other way around. Thank you. Absolutely. That, that was around 40 minutes, no? I think. Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. All right. All right. Um, th th this was interesting, um, but I, but I but it seems to me that there's a, another there's there's one thread you're proposing that the theory is in the texts and not in philosophy, which I think we might want to fight about that because it's once again putting Latin America at the back of the bus. Okay, that's one thing. Um, but another thing, what if you had organized this around the Baroque? What if you had started? would say where the theory that Latin America produces is what it took from Spain and scrambled up and put into the Baroque. And you could explain not only, you could explain, you could get to Daniela Rosell and say that she's not alone in the world, right? Marcos Lopez, the, the, the Argentine photographer, <coughs> Damien Schaub, the Chileno who works on the Neo Barroco and puts together all sorts of strange objects that you just have to look at, excess, 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 excess. I mean, there's another way of organizing historically hmm. a theoretical project in Latin America. Now, I, I don't know. Or maybe that's elsewhere in your project. Uh, thank you, Francine. So about you know putting Latin America in the, in the back of the bus. Um, yeah, I, I can see that. And you could look at uh, things like Veronica Gago, La Crítica de la Razón Neoliberal, or Oscar del Barco, writing on posthumanism, or, you know, Vivero de Castro, for, for good or ill. But I, I find that, I mean, I, that's, that's not really my, my project. I think that the more engaging critical interventions happens in, in the literature. And I, I, I am aware of my mediation, because um, texts do not read themselves. But again, I think the agency is distributed. And, uh, and um, in a sense, I, I hope to continue to accompany what the text or the art form um, in its imminence you know, provides. And so maybe you could say that I'm uh, an actor in an actor network theory. Um, but um, you know, the, the thing is there, and it, and it um, performs. And I, and I think the theoretical value is something that you won't find in in many texts in other literatures. So I, I want to highlight that. I think it's it's not because I think that theory is better than literature, but rather perhaps the opposite. I think literature thinks in more eloquent ways than some of our theoretical thinking. I, I go in the book into a little bit with um, Karl Ove Knauskart, and I know I'm mispronouncing his name horribly, the Norwegian writer, who's very interesting and who seems to be oblivious to the historicity of things mm -hmm. in a book like Autumn, uh, which has wonderful vignettes of things. Uh, it's a really great book. I, I don't like my struggle that much, but Autumn, I, I do. But when you put that side to side with Neruda, you know, who is the greatest fetishist of them all, and who's also very aware of the politicity of things, then you realize, well, maybe there's no there there, you know, in someone like Nausgaard. So that's my interest in, in, in reading with, with these texts. Now, the Baroque, sure, I, I, I think that would be a, a constellation, but I think it's not by virtue of the excess of the Baroque that you get to, 
to fetishism and to and to hyper fetishism. Um, I think um, not all forms of the Baroque dwell on um, on exchange value, for instance. It's uh, I, I I would have to think about this a little more. Mm -hmm. Now there is one picture in the book that was circulated that I, I highlighted there, which perhaps you saw, which is a picture of a couple that is maybe celebrating their. I want to say 30th uh, wedding anniversary or something like that. Um, they they are a mature couple. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't have time to include this in the slideshow, uh, but this is also in this book. And the the other uh, photographs can like train you to see this for what it is, right? And and there is of course a baroque altarpiece. Uh, but it's just a couple in a pretty dress, and it dissonates with the rest um, of the book. But I also think it it explains it. You know, um, maybe the the hyper fetishism is also in in, in the in the sequence. Uh, I, I spoke a lot about narrative and storytelling. I didn't have time to expand on on the book itself as narrative, but this is something that has also been missed, that this is um, a picture book, and it starts with um, religious imagery. Let me see if I can show you. There's, there's uh, re religious imagery first, then there's animals, um, there, there's, there's a narrative, you know, that, that explodes, I think, in that climax that is the couple standing by the altar, and it's like, whoa, you realize it's part of a, like a longer historical process. So I, it's not an, an answer, but a reaction. Thank you. I'm uh, sorry, I'm 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 what I call historical materialism and how it interfaces exactly with this theory. The question is, Marx is fetishism as an ideological rather than a more material operation as something to do with luxury. Uh, the way I understand to read Marx is something more of a technological determinist sense where he says things like the hand mill gives you the feudal lord and the steam mill gives you the capitalist and the gundries and preface to capital. It's the machine itself that's supposed to collapse exchange value, you know, lead to society not valued by hours of labor. Uh, so, post on is a citation of you or something like this, a mature Marx that's more, I use the word vulgar, you're trying to reclaim the vulgar, it's sort of mature in that sense. So, I don't know, I heard the Marx you engage with as more of this early Marx who deals with alienation and fetishism as uh, problems of suffering due to capitalism rather than as the fact that objects themselves are exchange value in our society, literally. And that's where fetishism is not an evaluation of luxury, but in having to deal with objects as completely apart from their use value. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, one can disagree about Marx in many ways. <laughs> and, and, and I'll disagree in one, which is I think post -Tone already is doing a revision of Marx. And um, he wants Marx to speak more to our day and age than uh, necessarily Marx does. He will forget things strategically, I think, to his advantage, to get the advantage of his argument, like Marx's critique on the Luddites that he considered infantile and pre-political. Uh, he would literally say the Luddites, they thought it was about the machines, and it's not about the machines, it's about the social relations of production. And the, here is where you can reply to Marx, no, it is about the machines. Of course it is about the machines. And the Luddite is a full-fledged uh, politics. I mean, we, we understand that after um, you know, neo-Luddism, um, uh, the work of Sheila Yasanov, uh, there's, there's, there's many sources to understand that from, from the vantage point. So I agree in the importance of the techno-social, but I don't think that Marx had really understood the, um, the agency uh, and, and self-sustaining power of material configurations. Um, and then in terms of historical materialism, um, your first question, the model I'm, I'm you know, writing about in this book, close to completion, this is part of a chapter, um, 
has to do with articulating historical and new materialism. So what do I keep with from the historical materialism? Uh, things like uh, the critique of the commodity, the notion of primitive accumulation, uh, some aspects of the general theory of value. What I bring also to the picture is this supplementarity, that if you think that the life of the thing is not over when the life of the commodity has begun, right? then uh, you can bring in all these insights, everything that we now know about um, the agency or agentiality of, of the non-human. Um, and ultimately, of course, I didn't have time to go into much detail, but it is the articulation of uh, human and non-human history, right? I mean, there's, there's something even about these pictures. It's a natural habitat. It's a setting. I mean, that's also part of the emphasis in something like this, you know, for, for these characters who are people, <coughs> This is, this is their world. This is the sedimentation of revolutionary history become landscape, right? And, uh, and we can engage with that, you know, just as critique. This is not a real image or think, which is more disquieting. No, this is a real household, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. We have time for one more question. Alejandro. Um, I, I just want to like summarize briefly like what you said at this part of your talk, at the beginning of your talk, if I understood correctly. You were saying that this um, hyper fetishism that you were tracking um, sort of like counters the um, notion of Latin America as a side of attractivism. <laughs> or or is that something I'm misunderstanding maybe? No, and that's a great question. Um, yeah. I wanted to like ask like two questions. Like the first one would be if um, by way of excess or by way of hyperfetishism, um, I don't understand how this hyperfetishism like sort of like renews or articulates another notion of Latin America that would counter that extractivist um, agenda. And the other one would be if this um, approach um, to literature that you are uh, articulating um, is only restricted to a specific set of corpus like of like this person specific or you can like extrapolate to more canonical works that have been read as exoticizing of the idea of Latin America like Garcia uh, Marquez or the boom in general. Right. Okay, so the first uh, of your two great questions. Um, so, one thing I, I was explaining to to an, an editor really about uh, this this book project project um, has to do with the question of why Latin America, and I think that Latin America is the region of the world that has been at both sides of extractivism for the longer period of time, for the longest period of time, right? Um, Latin America produces its own extractivism and is subject to extractivism. Um, when you compare to Africa, or, or uh, I'll leave it with Africa for now, right? Uh, Africa is more clearly um, the source of extractivism, and it produces less of its own extractivism. But I think the when you look at the relationship between the Latin American elites and um, their their countries of origin, uh, when you think of the the bridge through import um, substitution industrialization in the 60s and 70s, plan economy to neoliberalism, you know, Latin America produces someone like Carlos Slim, and so you could say that, you know, Carlos Slim is very Mexican, uh, maybe you have heard him talk, uh, and he's also, you know, the, the big uh, bad wolf. <laughs> I'm gonna have to edit that from the video, because um, <laughs> I do want to have internet at home. Anyways, uh, and so, I think that here you appreciate the contradictions of extractivism, and that would be also my criticism to to Erica Beckman's otherwise wonderful book. You know, it's like it's a it's a united Latin America against extractivism and so on, as it it was it were not part and parcel to it. I am reminded of how. Bear with me with these examples in the Colombian context. Someone would say, eh, "Colombia contra la guerrilla," and you're like, "La guerrilla is not part of Colombia." Oh, Colombia contra, that's, okay. But also, in a different political register, uh, there's the idea of El Ejército Invasor de Pinochet, or Pinochet contra los Chilenos, and Pinochet was this homegrown, you know, fascism. 
And so um, I, I am interested in works that in works that are on both sides of the subject-object divide of extractivism, and that's also maybe an, uh, a response to your your follow-up question. Um, Garcia Marquez was um, living in, in in Mexico City and going to Cine Clues and uh, being subsidized by his friends at his at the time that he recounts the 1928 banana strike massacre. So, I mean, you cannot really say that those boom texts are uh, testimonials, you know. They're, 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 they're really, uh, they're, they're the view of an elite, a, a lettered progressive elite, but they're the view of an elite. So I think that this approach maybe mediates between realms that we haven't been able to, to see in, in one sweep, um, you know. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you.